The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... I'm E.G. Marshall. Think. You are lying on your back. There's something above you, and it has blotches on it. Your head rolls to one side. A big shape is coming toward you. The shape makes strange little noises. For good or ill, it comes closer and closer. It hovers over you. It encircles you. It lifts you. It holds you. It thrusts something into your mouth. You are a baby. And you are 12 days old. Mirror, mirror on the wall. Who's the fairest of them all? You are my darling. You. Mirror, mirror on the wall. Who's the sweetest of them all? You, my angel. You. Mirror, mirror on the wall. Who's the cleverest of them all? You. 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 Our mystery drama, Mirror, Mirror, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Elspeth Eric and stars Marion Seldes. It is sponsored in part by True Value Hardware Stores and all state insurance companies. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Think how hard it is to be a very young baby. Helpless is the word for it. Unable to stand, sit, walk, or even turn over. Unable to distinguish one object from another. Only light from dark. Unable to comprehend what is said to you. Unable to convey your own feelings except with moans, gurgles, and crying. Unconscious of everything, really, except your own, your very own, very private person. I was in Mozambique with my husband when I heard of Claire's death. The letter from my mother gave no details, and there was no question of my being able to return home for the funeral. But I was pregnant with my first child and had already decided to go back to the States for the birth. Being close to 40 years of age, I needed the nearness of my mother and the care of American doctors. I was barely settled into my mother's house when the phone rang. Yes? Hello? Jessica, is that you? Yes? Well, it's Mrs. Connor, dear. Claire's mother. Well, of course, Mrs. Connor. I was going to call you. Well, your mother told me that you were coming back from that place. Uh, Mozambique. Yes, and, and I figured you might be home by now. I got here the day before yesterday. Well, Jessica, dear, I know you're going to have a baby. Yes, I am. But, uh, I wondered if you could find time to come by and see me. Well, of course. I was planning to anyway, just as soon as I got... I want to have a little talk with you. After all, you were Claire's dearest friend. Well, of course, Mrs. Connor. When would be convenient? This afternoon. Would that be all right? Perfectly all right. Five o'clock? Come for tea. And uh, we'll have a nice talk. And, well, there's something else. But never mind about that. I'll, I'll tell you when I see you. The air was cool and the sun was warm when I set out to walk the mile or so to where Mrs. Connor lived in the house that had been Claire's. It was September, very like the day nearly 25 years before when I had originally met Claire. That was the first night at Stapleton Academy, finishing school as it was called in those days, and the main corridor was filled with laughing, chattering girls. Some of them were there for the second year, but it was my first experience away from home. I stood stiffly against the wall and envied those who seemed so relaxed, so easy in their ways. Hello. Oh, hello. I like your dress. Thank you. I like yours. My mother made it. Oh. 
My name's Claire Connor. That's a pretty name. What's yours? Oh, uh, Jessica Chapman. Are you a boarder or a day pupil? What? You live in Stapleton. Oh, no, Chicago. Uh, just outside, that is. Oh, you don't mean it. You can't. We're outside. It's a suburb. Sugar Glen. Sugar Glen. You don't mean it. You can't. Where do you live? Oh, I'm embarrassed to tell you, Merton. But that's very near Sugar Glen. Mm, it's the other side of the track. But I go to Merton a lot when I'm home. I go there all the time to take to to take the elevated into Chicago. I know. Well, it it always seemed very nice, Merton. Well, it's not. But I won't always live there. You see, someday I'll live in Sugar Glen or New York or Paris or Venice, one of those places. Listen, have you got a roommate or a, a room by yourself? I don't know yet. They haven't told me. Well, let's ask if we can room together. You want to? Oh, yes. Well, we'll have lots of fun. We'll be best friends. You want to? And we'll tell each other everything and not tell anybody else. It'll be just you and me. You want to? Oh, yes, yes. And so it came about. That night, Claire and I sat up till daybreak, eating ginger snaps and zuzus and drinking orange squash and sucking on bullseyes. The next day, I broke out in hives and had to go to the infirmary. But Claire came to see me there and stayed as long as they'd let her. Well, classes don't start till tomorrow, so you haven't missed anything. Oh, oh, I bought some material for drapes. I hope you like it. You see, it's pink, which is my favorite color, and has blue flowers and stuff. Oh, how are your hives? Do they itch? And so it was all year. Just Claire and me. I'd never had a best friend before, and I'd never known anyone like Claire. We'd go into town together and have chocolate fudge marshmallow sundaes with nuts. And sometimes we sneaked off to see a movie, if it had Joan Crawford in it. Because Joan was Claire's idol. One day we were in Stapleton, and we saw this little antique shop. And in the window, there was a mirror. Oh, Jessica, look. Look at what? That mirror. Oh, it's beautiful, isn't it? Oh, I give my immortal soul. Look, it's got three panels. You could see yourself front, back, and sideways all at once, practically. Oh, I bet it costs a jillion dollars. Oh, that gold carving. You want to go in? You want to? You bet. Yes, young ladies? Well, we wanted to ask you about that uh, gold mirror in the window. You're interested in the mirror? Uh, kind of. You show good taste. It's very old, that mirror. My wife found it in Paris. Oh. It used to belong to Sarah Bernhardt. The actress? The great Bernhardt herself. That's what they told my wife in Paris. Oh, well, is it, uh, uh how much is it expensive? Priceless. That's what I thought. How much do you think you could spend? Well, not very much. How much is it? Well, I should get $500 for it. Come on, Jess. However, I'd take a little less. 400 Oh, I'm afraid we don't have anywhere near that. Thank you, anyway. Come back any time. We'll talk about it. Jeepers. $500. dollars that's all the money in the whole world. You could save up for it. Oh, you know what my allowance is. Twenty dollars a month. That's the smallest allowance of any girl in the school. I felt awful for days after that. My family sent me one hundred dollars every month, and I never spent all of it. There weren't that many things to spend it on. Finally, it came to me that the thing that would make me happiest would be to give Claire the mirror. Jessica! Oh, Jessica! I, I can't believe it! Oh, you, you are the dearest, the sweetest. You are my best friend. You are my only friend. It's you and me, Jessie. Just you and me against the whole world forever and ever. Remembering all this, I was smiling a little as I arrived at the house. But the smile faded as I wondered what I'd say to Claire's mother. There's so little to say at such times, and so much had happened since the days at Stapleton Academy. <laughs> I needn't have been concerned, though, because Mrs. Connor did most of the talking. You and Claire were so close. Such dear friends, Jessica. 
You were her only friend, her only real friend. <laughs> you understood her. I... I was very fond of her. Now, I've been going through her things. She had so many lovely things. <laughs> Two mink coats. <laughs> and a mole skin and jewelry. Oh, heavens. Later, when we've had our tea, I'll take you upstairs and show you. And you can pick out whatever you like as a remembrance. Oh, I don't wear much jewelry anymore, Mrs. Connor. You see, I married an archaeologist last year, and we travel a lot to very out-of-the-way places. Oh. And... But there must be something of Claire's you'd want. Well, actually, Mrs. Connor, there is one thing I'd love to have. That big mirror. Claire had it at the academy. Uh, you wouldn't want that mirror. Oh, yes, I would. <laughs> I, I gave it to her, actually. And I've never forgotten how she loved it. Uh, I could store it at my mother's house till my husband and I settled down enough to have a place of our own. I, um... I don't know where it is. Oh, maybe you don't know the one I mean. It's a three-way mirror, full-length mirror. Claire loved it because she could see herself from every angle. <laughs> it has a lovely gold frame. Oh, and the man who sold it to me said that it had belonged to Sarah Bernhardt. Though, of course, we I, never believed um, it. I'll have to look around for it. Well, she always kept it in her bedroom. You are going to have a baby. Is that right? Yes. Imagine. At my age. <laughs> Melisande came back for the funeral. At least she did that. Her father didn't. Well, Stanley and Claire were divorced. Oh, not divorced. Oh, never divorced. He just up and left her and took Melly with him. But Melisande wanted to live with her father, Mrs. Connor. Yes. And after all Claire did for her, from the instant the child was born, she raised her exactly the way she'd been raised herself, with all the care and attention... Uh, Millie was never very pretty, you know, like Claire. Strange, <laughs> because Claire was so lovely. And Stanley was a handsome man, whatever else he was or was not. But poor Millie. And Claire did everything for her. Clothes, lessons. The child could speak French at the age of seven. And Claire had her nose fixed. Gave her a cute little turned-up nose. And if Stanley hadn't snatched her off when he did, Claire was going to have her chin altered, shortened sort of to balance her nose, the way I had Claire's legs fixed. Oh, Claire had beautiful legs. Uh huh. But she wouldn't have had if I hadn't had them broken and straightened. You had her legs broken and straightened. It's a simple procedure. Claire was born with slightly bowed legs, unfortunately, but the operation made them absolutely perfect. Nellie never had those advantages when she went to live with Stanley. When I saw her at the funeral, she had a certain, a certain chic. But it wasn't at all what Claire wanted for her. Stanley never did anything for her, not a thing. He just let her grow up. Precisely. Well, now, why don't we have our tea? I have oatmeal cookies I made myself. I just have to pop them in the oven. <laughs> Remember how you and Claire loved oatmeal cookies? <laughs> With lots and lots of raisins? Well, while you're doing that, Mrs. Connor, could I go upstairs and look for the mirror? I just remembered. It's broken. Broken? Yes. Yes, it broke. Oh, well, I could have it fixed. I think we threw it out. <laughs> Claire would never have thrown it out. Look, if it's just the glass that's broken, I could have it replaced, and that would be simple. I, I really don't know what happened to it. Best forget about it. Now, you just sit there, Jessica, while I give the cookies ten minutes in the oven and set up the tea tray. <laughs> All right? All right, Mrs. Connor. <laughs> and um, forget about the mirror. Don't even think about it. <laughs> Have you ever tried not to think about something? Anything from immortality to a lavender mouse? You will find that in your striving to avoid thinking about certain things, you become totally unable to think about anything else. This is the impasse Jessica reached when Mrs. Connor said, Forget about the mirror. Don't even think about it. We'll return shortly with Act Two. ever bothered you, however slightly, that never, never will you see your own face? Anyone else can see it, and many do every day, by sunlight, 
By moonlight? By candlelight? Or in the glare of searchlights? Mm -hmm. But you yourself have never seen it. Nor will you ever see it. Except in a mirror. So I tried not to think about the mirror. I thought about Stanley. Good old Stanley. I'd known him all my life. Stanley was very handsome, with lovely manners, always had money to spend and spent it generously, and was consistently, everlastingly dull. Such a nice boy, my mother said, and I couldn't deny it. But I longed to know other boys. Not so nice, maybe, but likewise not so dull. Like the boys Claire knew. How do you do it, Claire? All the boys are chasing after you all the time. You're so popular. Oh, you've got Stanley. Oh, Stanley. I want to know scads of boys the way you do. But they just don't know I'm alive. It's easy. You really want to know? Oh, I'll say the world. There's only two things you have to learn how to make a boy notice you. No fooling. Hmm. You won't tell anybody else? Word of honor. Well, the first is, I had a dream about you last night. And if that doesn't work, you say... I have a bone to pick with you. I don't get it. <laughs> Why would you say things like that? Because they're intriguing. You tell a boy you had a dream about him, he can't wait to find out about what you dreamed. Now, the same thing if he thinks you're a little mad at him. Not really mad, just sort of miffed. Comprendez vous? <laughs> I don't know if I do. <laughs> Try it. You'll see. It works. Well, it didn't work for me. Maybe I didn't say it right. Most of the boys just gave me a blank stare. Once it were, sort of, with Charlie Gale. He came up to me at the end of a dance and said, Okay, what'd you dream about me? And I said, I forget. <laughs> because, of course, I hadn't ever dreamed about Charlie Gale, and I hadn't the forethought to think up some things. Charlie said, Well, it couldn't have been much of a dream if you can't remember it, and he walked away. I never tried out. I have a bone to pick with you. Because I was never really mad at anybody. Not even miffed. I never got to know anybody that well. So I was stuck with Stanley, and he took me to dances and movies and parties. And everybody took it for granted that one day, Stanley and I would get married. I started taking it for granted myself. But he's so good-looking, Jesse. I think he looks like, mm, John Gilbert. I guess so. And rich. I guess so. And he graduated from Princeton. Yep. Yeah. Well, what do you want? I don't know. Oh, he's crazy mad for you. He's your slave. I was very fond of Stanley. I'd always been fond of Stanley. And my mother kept telling me that I'd love him once we were married. And I started to believe that. One night at my house, Stanley had come for dinner. And my folks left us alone after dinner because they trusted Stanley implicitly. And he and I had been talking in the desultory way we always did about announcing our engagement, setting a date, and whether to buy a house or rent an apartment. All those topics that sounded to me more as though we were going to open a small business rather than get married. When all of a sudden, Stanley jumped up from his chair. Guess what that nutty friend of yours said to me the other night. Who? Claire Connor. What'd she say? She said she had a dream about me. Can you tie that... Did you ask her what the dream was about? Well, sure. I was kind of, sort of... Intrigued? Yeah, yeah, sort of intrigued. Well, what was the dream? Ah, some goofy stuff. You know how dreams are. Seems I was uh, some kind of knight. Like uh, Lancelot or Gawain, one of those. And she was Elaine, the lily maid of Astolat. And Merlin the magician was there, and he... And this was all in Camelot? No, no, it was right here in Sugar Glen. That's the intriguing part of it. Out on the golf course at the country club. Seems I rescued her from the sand trap on the 16th hole. I told you it was a nutty dream. Well, how would Claire know there was a sand trap on the 16th hole? She doesn't play golf. The Connors don't even belong to the club. Well, I know, but she walked around with me one day. Somebody stood her up for a date, and she didn't have anything to do. But wasn't that a nutty dream? <laughs> Claire's family didn't belong to the country club. Not many people from Merton did. But I'd invited her there lots of times. Actually, I was sort of showing off. She was so pretty, so peppy. And in those days, being peppy was about the most important thing to be. And I wasn't 
peppy. I was shy and introverted, and lots of girls and boys, too, considered me a drip. It was very depressing to be considered a drip. But Stanley didn't think of me as a drip. He thought of me as a peach of a girl. And this made me, if not more loving toward him, at least more grateful. But then... Jesse, I've got to talk to you. What about? What's the matter? I think Claire's mad at me. What about? I don't know. That's just it. I saw her at the sweet shop this noon. She was with Charlie Gale, and they were right at the next table, and all of a sudden she leans over and she says, I've got a bone to pick with you, Stanley Sherman. Naturally, I said, why? What have I done? And she said, tell you later. I thought maybe she told you. No, Stanley. She didn't tell me. Not that I give a hoot, but I hate to have anybody mad at me. You know how it is. Oh, sure. I know how it is. I knew how it was, all right. And I knew I was losing Stanley. Claire's line was working on Stanley. My Stanley, who didn't have a line any more than I did. You know what Claire was mad at me about? What? Because I hadn't called her up for two weeks. I hardly ever call her up, except once in a while when you're busy. I asked her a couple of times if she wanted to walk around the golf course with me because I couldn't find anybody to play with. She wanted to carry my clubs, but of course I wouldn't let her do that. Of course you wouldn't. But she was awfully interested in the game. She said she'd take some lessons, only of course you can't do that unless you belong to the club. I may have said something about teaching her myself. She says I did. But if I did, I forgot. Claire didn't forget. No, no, and she's been feeling terrible about it. And that's what she meant when she said she had a bone to pick with me. Can you tie that? I wasn't a bit surprised when Stanley called me a few weeks later and said he had to have a talk with me. A serious talk, he said. And I knew instantly what the serious talk would be about. It would be about Claire. You're going to think I'm a heel, Jessica. No, I'm not. I don't know how it happened. I swear to you. How what happened, Stanley? I... I fell for somebody. Claire? How did you know? I just knew. Your best friend. I'm an awful heel. Are you in love with her? I, uh... I... Yes, I am. Do you want to marry her? Yes. Well, then, do it. You mean it's all right with you? We were never really engaged. Well, we talked about it. That's all we ever did. Just talk. Oh. <laughs> I feel so much better. I thought maybe you'd... Uh, I was so afraid that I you... I just want you to be happy, Stanley. You should know that. Oh, I'll be happy, all right. You've already asked Claire to marry you? Yeah. Anyway, I said something or other... I was telling her she was a wonderful girl, so much fun and pretty, too, and I couldn't imagine any man not being in love with her. And she said, does that mean you, too? And, well, I said, yes, me, too. And she said how happy she was and could we build a house in Sugar Glen, and I just, well, I said I thought it was a neat idea. And the more I thought about it... The neater it seemed. Yeah, yeah. Oh, Jesse, you really are a peach. There's not many girls would be so understanding. I told you. I just want you to be happy. You know what Claire said after we got it all settled about the house and everything? You know what she said? What did she say? She said, it'll be just you and me, Stanley. You and me against the whole world till death do us part. And right then I knew she was the girl for me. I felt very little when Stanley married Claire... Ours had been such a tepid romance, if indeed it had ever been a romance at all. I was still friends with both Stanley and Claire. He built her a big house in Sugar Glen, and they had a pierce arrow and a packet roadster with wire wheels. They went to all the country club dances, and they gave wonderful parties in the big house. Suddenly, sitting in the drawing room of that very house, waiting for Claire's mother to serve tea... My mind jumped to the big bedroom just above me, Claire's bedroom. A big, square room with six windows, all curtained with white silk net with ruffles. A chaise long with a blue satin throw covered with real duchess lace. 
dressing table, holding more than a dozen bottles of French perfume, a white bearskin rug beside the big canopied bed. All so different from anything she'd had before she married Stanley. Everything different, except the mirror. And there I was, thinking about the mirror again. Well, here we are now. I brought milk and sugar and lemon because I couldn't quite remember. Uh, now, why don't you pour? And I'll go and get the cookies. I had to let them cool for a minute, but I'm sure they're ready now. Uh, I'll be right back. The mirror. I couldn't get the mirror out of my mind. It was my strongest link with Claire. The thought of it took me back 20 years. Now, Claire was dead. I was married. I was about to have my first child. I was sitting in Claire's house, waiting for Claire's mother to serve me oatmeal cookies. And all I could think of was the three-panel gold frame mirror that I had given Claire when we were schoolgirls. I have to give them another minute to cool. They're still sticking to the pan. Let's have a cup of tea, and then they'll be ready. You pour, will you? If you want me to. Just lemon for me. All right. There you are. Oh, thank you. Mrs. Connor, about that mirror of Claire's... Oh, I'm sorry. Oh. Why do you keep talking about that mirror? Did you burn yourself? You... You keep going on and on about that no, mirror. No, oh, Mrs. Connor... I told Connor. you to forget about oh, it. Oh, I'm so sorry. That I... mirror. That cursed mirror. That mirror... Killed my precious Claire. That mirror killed my baby. Are you wondering how an inanimate thing like a mirror could murder a living person? How a thing of gold and glass and quicksilver could bring death to a woman of flesh and blood? How a thing of ornamental beauty and some practical use could prove fatal to its owner? We'll tell you how when I bring you Act Three in a moment. Jessica, paying a condolence call on the mother of her dead friend, Claire, keeps returning to the subject of an antique gold-framed three-panel mirror which she had given to Claire when the two of them were best friends at Stapleton Academy for young ladies. Claire's mother became so agitated at the mere thought of the mirror that she dropped her cup of tea. That mirror, that cursed mirror, that mirror killed... My precious Claire. Oh, Mrs. Connor, I didn't know. killed my baby. Nobody told me. Well, there were a lot of confused stories about it. None of them true. But what was true? How could the mirror... The have... mirror... fell over. On top of her. Oh, no. But how could it? I don't know. It was very old, of course, and I... I suppose it had got to be very rickety and unstable. But it just doesn't seem possible. There was glass all over the floor. Claire was cut horribly. She... She bled to death. Oh, Mrs. Carr. She was all alone in the house. I'll never forgive myself for not being there. But you couldn't have known. Not possibly. You can't blame yourself in any way. I, uh... I came here to live with her, you know, uh, after Stanley deserted her and Melisande went to live with him. So uh, I moved in and we tried to make some kind of a life. I, I remember Claire said to me, it's just you and me now, Mummy. Just you and me. Like when I was little. And then not to be there when that terrible mirror killed her. We won't talk any more about the mirror, Mrs. Connor. I am so sorry that I kept bringing it up, but I didn't know that it had any... You... You won't want the mirror now, will you? Well, we'll, we'll just forget all about it. I... I think that would be best. <clears throat> well, now... Tell me about yourself. 
You're going to have a baby? Yes, at my age. <laughs> I hope it's a little girl. A pretty little girl that you can dress up in lovely clothes and teach all sorts of things. <laughs> How to get along in the world. It's not easy for a woman, you know. As I used to tell Claire. Oh, I don't think it's easy for anybody. Oh, maybe not, maybe not, but especially a woman. Oh, heavens, I completely forgot about the cookies. Never mind about the cookies. I ought to be getting on home. Well, I, uh, I could wrap some up for you to take with you. No, never mind. I think you need to be alone right now. I'm afraid I've upset you. Oh, that's all right, my dear. You didn't know. I'll come back another time. If you do that, dear... And we'll talk some more about Claire. As I walked home, I thought about the last time I'd ever seen Claire. It was a very special visit, because I had something very special to tell her. I found her in her big, airy bedroom, standing in front of the three-way mirror. Oh, the mirror again. It wasn't going to be so easy to forget that mirror. Jessie, come on in. How do you like this dress? It's beautiful. Well, Charlie Gale is taking me to the club dance Saturday night. Who is Charlie? Oh, you know Charlie, sort of a goop. But he's better than nothing. Oh, you know, before I wouldn't have looked at him twice, but now... Do you ever hear from Stanley? Well, he writes me every month, first of every month, when he sends me the check. He doesn't write anything except how Melly's doing. So I don't know how he is. Oh, well. Well, I married a millionaire. And look how it turned out. Claire, I've come over on purpose to tell you something. Oh, what? I'm getting married. You what? It's true. I'm getting married. Who to? Oh, you don't know him. His name's Bob Orlovsky. He's an archaeologist. Oh, what kind of name is that, or, or love? We'll be traveling a lot. He goes on digs. That's what they call those expeditions where they dig up old ruins. And I'll go with him. Is he good looking? Well, not very. <laughs> but he's a beautiful person, and I love him a lot. Am I going to meet this beautiful person? I'm afraid not. I'm going to meet him in New York, and we're going to get married there. And then we'll be leaving right away. But you're not going to have a wedding? Well, I'm a little old for that, don't you think? No, we'll just get a judge or somebody like that to marry us, and then we'll be off the next but day. But doesn't your mother want you to have a wedding? She doesn't care. I think she's so happy to get me off her hands. Aren't you ever coming back to Sugar Glen? Well, eventually. Maybe. We don't know. Oh, well, we'll probably visit from time to time. But well, what'll I do without you? You'll be all right. Oh, you always manage somehow. Look, I, I have to be going. Oh, yes. Goodbye, Jessie. Be happy. I shall. I know I shall. Yes, well, write to me when you have time. Well, of course I will. Goodbye, Claire. Best friend. Bye. I had gone only a few steps down the hall when I heard Claire's voice. I thought she'd remembered some last-minute message for me, so I'd gone back. The door of her room was still open. Claire stood before the three-way mirror, and she was speaking, not to me, but to her own reflection, speaking softly, tenderly, lovingly. It's just you and me now, sweetie. Just you and me against the world. It's you and me, honey. Just you and me. From somewhere, and who knows where, had come other voices. Soft, tender, loving. My sweet baby. You're so wonderful, Claire. Claire, you're so popular. So happy and everything. My beautiful, precious girl. All those boys chasing you? Darling child, adorable girl, dearest heart. So lovely, so wonderful. 
walking home, it all came back to me. But how much of it had really happened? I had seen Claire, dressed in her pretty ball gown, standing in front of the mirror. That much had been real. I was sure of that. And I had heard her talking to her reflection. I was pretty sure of that. But where had the other voices come from? Her mother's. Stanley's. My own. Had they drifted down the years to echo themselves at that particular moment? Or had they emerged from my own mind, so attuned to Claire for so long, so worshipful of her person, her ways, her personality, her whole self? I began to understand a little. Everyone who had known Claire intimately had adored her. First her mother, then me, then Stanley. All of us her devoted acolytes. Only Melisande, her own daughter, had refused to bow down. I wondered, had we, the three of us who worshipped her, been picked for that very reason? Or had it been some lack in us, some deficiency that made us seek her out. Some feeling of incompleteness that made us need someone stronger, surer, someone who seemed so enviable in every way. Lost in my own reflections, I was not at all surprised when I reached home and there, sitting on the front steps, was Stanley. It seemed very right that he should be there. Hello, Jesse. Stanley? I heard you were in town. I'm going to have a baby. Yeah, yeah. I heard that, too. That's wonderful. I think so. How are you, Stanley? Oh, same as usual, I guess. How's Melisande? Great. Melly's just great. Oh, good. I'm glad. Uh, could we sort of sit down on the steps talk for a few minutes? We can go inside. No, no, this is all right. Unless you'd rather. No, no, this is... Okay. Swell. Well, you look wonderful. Absolutely wonderful. <laughs> it's being pregnant, does it? Really? No. Being happily married is what does it, but being pregnant is extra. Yeah. I sure missed the boat with you, Jesse. Oh, we wouldn't necessarily have been happy married to each other, Stanley. Maybe not. I ever tell you why I left Claire? No, you didn't. I'm not very quick at catching on to things. It took me about a year to find out why Claire married me. It was to show me off. Oh, Stanley. Yep, to show me off. It wasn't the money. The money was important, but it wasn't just the money. It was other things. Now, you may not agree, but... Uh... I'm not bad looking. You're very handsome. Well, I was. You still are. And that was important to Claire. She was always after me to get my suits made in London, Bond Street, that sort of dribble. <laughs> and I wasn't allowed to wear the same suit two days in a row. That's hard. <laughs> and it was important to Claire that I had, well, what you'd call good manners. You always had good manners. I remember very well. I was brought up that way. I didn't have anything to do with that. And she liked it that I could speak good French. But that was because I took French in school. Six years of it. It wasn't my fault I could speak good French. It didn't have anything to do with me. And I knew a lot about food. Well, my mother knew a lot about food, so naturally I... Claire didn't have a chance to learn all those things while she was growing but up. But those things didn't have anything to do with me. They were all learned things. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yes, Stanley, I do. I got the feeling like some tailor's dummy ordering fancy food in perfect French. <laughs> That's really very funny. <laughs> so, I left. And... And Nellie went with you? Yes, because she was turning into a little dummy, too. I mean, a little mannequin with perfect clothes and perfect manners. Yes, and a perfect French accent. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and she couldn't stand it either. Do you know where I've just come from, Stanley? No, Where? Your old house. The one you built for Claire. I went to see Mrs. Connor. She wanted to talk about Claire. I ought to go see her, I know. 
but I didn't even go to the funeral. Nellie went. Mrs. Connor told me. And she told me the awful way Claire died. Yeah, that was pretty awful, all right. And it was especially awful for me, because I gave her that mirror. I know. When you were in school together, she loved that mirror. It's so hard to see how it could have fallen on her. I mean, it was very sturdy, you know, even if it was old. What do you mean, fell on her? The mirror fell over on her and cut her. Oh, didn't you know? You must have. She... She bled to death. It didn't fall on her. Mrs. Connor told me. She smashed it. She put her fist through it. You... You can't mean that. How do you know? Well, Melly told me. Melly saw the mirror. Three big holes, one in each panel. But she was cut all over. No, she wasn't. Just the main artery in her right wrist. The mirror was still standing when they found her. Why? Why would she do a thing like that? I don't know. I'm not much good at figuring out things like that. But I know what I think. What do you think, Stanley? I think she just got tired of looking at herself in the mirror and nobody looking back at her. And so we come back to the very young baby, the one we mentioned at the beginning of our story. Twelve days old and unconscious of everything but his own small self. Perhaps by now he has discovered his fist. Later on, he will discover his toes and other interesting parts of his body. But it will take a long time before he discovers things outside his own person, people other than himself, and an even longer time before he learns to love them. I'll be back shortly. we have tried to tell you is the story of a narcissist, someone eternally in love with himself, in this instance, herself. All of us are susceptible to this affliction. We all continue to dote on ourselves long past the age when we should be turning our interest elsewhere, but we never do completely. And the result is that the world is largely populated by very large babies by children grown old. Our cast included Marion Seldes, Carmen Matthews, Marion Haley, and Nat Polan. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. Good Lord. Oh, no. Not again. Our room's been ransacked. What a mess. Every drawer open. Look what they've done to our clothes. Oh. Well, at least they've left us something. Not like before when I lost everything I owned. Yeah, well, we'll soon find out what they did take. Let's see. Not interested in my jewelry or the pocket radio. You'd think someone might take that. They busted open this suitcase, but the traveler's checks are still here. Peter, I haven't missed anything yet. Ooh, but it's a nasty feeling to have someone paw through your personal things. Oh, you know Ooh. what they were looking for. Now, where did you hide it? What, Peter? Our most important piece of evidence, your photograph of the painting. I told you it's in a very safe place. You have the photograph. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. <laughs> <laughs>